Ugh, Stop. You know what? It is a fragment. All right, I'm going to crank it up a notch. I'm going to give you Jim on seven. Welcome to the Blue Sky Podcast, Nanotechnology versus the Superbugs. I'm your host, Jim Lynch. And I'm Nicole cassell -Moore. Today we're going to talk about a new way to fight a growing threat to modern medicine. Nicole, did you know that antibiotic-resistant superbugs will kill someone in the United States every 15 minutes? Technically, I did know that because it came up at the news meeting this morning. I remember something in one of your stories about how long it takes to develop a new antibiotic and how difficult it is. For years and years, we've been able to sit back and just rely on old antibiotics. Situations where one didn't work, you just moved on to the other one. And then in the worst case scenarios where there were, you know, multiple drugs that didn't do the job, at one point you sort of bring in that was at the antibiotic of last resort. You know, there are ones that are the heavy hitters that are supposed to just come in and do the job, and some of those don't work now either. So we've been able to rely on old drugs for far too long, and now that we need new ones, the economic incentive isn't there. Actually getting something from the early stages through testing, through trials, and then onto market, it takes an awful long time, and antibiotic resistance is not sitting around waiting. Do you have any good news, or is this another episode of Jim's Podcast of Doom? Well, I can say something about your climate change episode, but I'll take the high road here. Because in fact, I do have good news. Engineers are getting into the antibiotics game with a mix of big data and made-to-order nanoparticles that they're calling nanobiotics. Nanobiotics. It sounds small. Yes. Nano is actually the Greek word for we. Actually, they're relatively big. Regular antibiotics tend to be small molecules, just a few dozen atoms stuck together. Nanoparticles, on the other hand, those tend to be a few hundred atoms across. Okay, but why would we want nanoparticles as antibiotics? I'm going to get to that, but first I want you to hear how Angela Violi, a professor of mechanical engineering and the leader of the Blue Sky Project on nanobiotics, let's hear how she explains where we are with regular antibiotics. What's the situation with antibiotics right now? Why is there a need to develop a new class of treatments? Over the last 75 years, we have been using those miracle drugs that have cured any type of infection that we um, have been seeing. But there are already uh, infections across the world um, for which out of the 100 antibiotics that we have, maybe one, two work. And in some cases, none of them works. The problem is that uh, bacteria are uh, um, very smart, and so what they have done is uh, becoming resistant to our antibiotics at this point. I understand that resistance makes bacteria hard or impossible to kill, but how do they actually become resistant? Professor Violi explained that evolution gave bacteria the mechanism they need to become resistant to antibiotics, but we're the ones who gave them the conditions needed to actually do it. When bacteria are exposed to antibiotics, the ones that are susceptible to the antibiotic die. In our bodies, that gives us a leg up so that our immune systems can kill the ones that stay behind. Okay, so too much exposure to antibiotics means that by the time the bacteria are infecting our bodies, it's already only the resistant ones that yeah. are left behind? Yeah, that's it. And when you dose a person with antibiotics, it doesn't cut down the number of bacteria. They're mostly resistant. It's all on the immune system to sink or swim, just like it was before we had antibiotics. That's pretty grim. So this is all because we go to the doctor with a cold virus yeah. and they prescribe us antibiotics so we feel like we got our money's worth for the copay. Yeah, that's part of the story, but the other part is in the way we farm. Here's Angela again. One of the main reasons why we have this crisis at this point is that if we look, for example, at the United States, 80% of the prescription in the last years for antibiotics were mainly not for humans, but more for uh, uh, poultry, for farm conditions, livestock. So uh, antibiotics are given not only um, you know, to survive the cramming condition of a farm. Once they get in the meat, then they get in the water also, and we are exposed to that once we eat meat, for example. Every time the bacteria get exposed to an antibiotic, it has a chance to break the code for the resistance. 80% of the problem is in agriculture? Yeah, but things are getting better in that front. As of 2017, antibiotics that are used to treat human infections can't be mixed into animal feed at low doses anymore. Wait, they were actually doing that before? Yeah, weirdly, it resulted in meat that was lower in fat. But we're still treating sick livestock with antibiotics that are also used by humans? Yeah, we also treat groups of livestock when there's a risk of infection spreading. Other antibiotics used exclusively for animals can still be mixed into the feed, 
We use a lot of antibiotics in agriculture, even now. And then the human prescriptions are the other 20% of the problem. Well, not all of that 20% is a problem, but the Centers for Disease Control estimate that about a third of those human prescriptions are actually unnecessary. A full third of them. So people who didn't have a bacterial infection or were going to get better soon anyway. So where is this heading? Well, Professor Violi cited a study out of the United Kingdom that said by 2050, deaths due to infections could outpace those due to cancer. And those are currently 10 million per year. To put that in perspective, global deaths due to antibiotic-resistant bacteria are about 700,000 per year today. Okay, so what are the pharmaceutical companies doing about this? Are they looking at this new demand and trying to develop new drugs? Well, that's a quirk of capitalist economics. Let's hear some more from Professor Violi on this. If you think about, you know, like a pharmaceutical company, it's more um, interesting to put money in a blood pressure drug or uh, um, cholesterol uh, uh, drugs rather than an antibiotic that people take for like 10 days. The idea is that it's more convenient to uh, develop a drug that uh, someone can take for the lifetime, the whole lifetime, rather than for 10 days. So it's not worth it for them to make new antibiotics because bacterial infections aren't chronic conditions. Yeah, that's the idea. The economic incentive isn't there. For me to develop something like an antibiotic for something that's rare or is not affecting a huge percentage of the population, at best I'm going to make this much money off that. At the same time, I could be investing all of my research and development money in Viagra, which apparently is a very popular drug, I've heard. So that's where pharma puts its eggs. You know, it's hard to get money f to treat rare diseases. It's hard to get money to research them. Maybe the answer is this. <laughs> Fund research into innovative ideas like we're doing right now. I also spoke with one of our collaborators, Scott Van Epps. He's a professor of emergency medicine. Not only does Big Pharma not have a strong incentive to make new antibiotics, they also don't have a good technique. He's referring to this Blue Sky project? Yes, the Nanobiotics Blue Sky team. When you talk about a different approach, you mean something drastic. I think when you and I spoke a, a year or two ago, you were talking about the minuscule changes to drugs can have a big impact, but it doesn't take much then for the pathogen to make its own changes, right? Yeah. That is terrifying. Well, it's not good. But this explanation is really illuminating in that it's, it's not just the way we use antibiotics that's the problem, it's the way we make them. We're always in this evolutionary arms race, and we're losing. Here's Angela again. The weird thing is that people get excited about drugs for diabetes, for example, like insulin. Insulin can allow you to survive, or uh, blood pressure drugs allow you to survive. But there are only few drugs that actually can cure you. And antibiotics can institute a cure within days. They are amazing. And what people don't understand is that if we lost antibiotic, we lose a lot of things, including a lot of surgery. They require a prophylactic, um, you know, taking over the antibiotic, anything that can um, install a foreign object in your body. But I guess more than anything, uh, we lose the ability to, I say, live the daily life. Because, you know, in the moment you can imagine that even if you scratch yourself, you can get an infection that cannot be solved, then I think your um, way, your confidence towards life will change. Already our deaths in the United States due to antibiotic resistance are about as high as those from car accidents. Wow. Antibiotic resistance are projected to increase about tenfold. Or you could get into a car accident, get taken to the hospital, and then die of an antibiotic resistant infection. You sound like you could use some good news. Tell me how nanobiotics can save the day. Well, antibiotic development is usually a trial and error process. Researchers test various molecules to see if they can kill bacteria without harming us. Once we have a kind of molecule that works, we make variations on that. 
That's how most of our new antibiotics are made. That's the strategy that is no longer good enough. Like Professor Van Epps was saying about the pharma companies. Exactly. Now what his Blue Sky team wants to do is design a way to keep producing new classes of antibiotics. Antibiotics that work in a whole new way. Before, we had to find those antibiotics in part through luck. And Professor Violi is trying to make that serendipity intentional. The idea is to intelligently design a nanomaterial. The reason why we do a nanoparticle instead of the molecule is that when you have a nanoparticle, your degree of freedom, the ability to design, it's uh, much bigger. You can look at shape, you can have a chemical composition, you can look at charges. There are a lot of parameters that you can tweak. It's basically a blank slate for you. Yes, that basically you can tweak and tune uh, for your goal. So they have more options for designing nanoparticles than they do with molecules? Yep. Too many options can be overwhelming, though. They're getting some computational help. It can be overwhelming to try to choose a movie on Netflix, but then they have that algorithm that sifts through the galaxy of films for recommendations. Oh, they're doing machine learning? Yes, yes, and this is one of the really interesting things about it. We are also creating a new database, collecting data from different resources. So we are trying to gather as much information as possible from whatever is available in the literature, but also collaboration with other uh, institutions. Help me understand, why do they need the other institutions if they also have the literature? Well, because what they really need is the failures. A failed antibiotic doesn't get a paper written about it. So you want to basically learn from the mistakes that have been made. I've heard about a movement in science to publish more about what doesn't work. People have even launched some journals specifically for negative results. I'm sure those make enthralling reading. Well, those journals tend to fail, too. Well, in this case, Professor Bailey's team does want those boring results so they can feed the data into the nanobiotics computer model. Here's Scott again. It is a hungry monster for data, right? The more data it has, the smarter it gets. And there's such a dearth of that information out there. We only publish what we're successful with. If you look at it that way, then the computer just thinks that everything works because it only ever sees positives. We actually benefit from our failures a lot more in this particular case because every failure is a place where the computer goes, this is something I shouldn't do. So we should be rooting for you to fail. To some degree, yeah, I mean. So we're hoping for failure. Well, just enough failure so that the computer model knows what not to do. Okay, but what do they want the computer model to do? Why do they think that nanobiotics could be better? Earlier, we had Professor Violi talk about how they have more degrees of freedom to play with when they're designing nanoparticles than they do with conventional drugs. Conventional drugs attack bacteria on just one front, but nanoparticles could work in more ways at once. I see, so they could target more of the bacteria's potential weak points all at the same time. That, and also one of their big strong points. Biofilm is uh, the structures, uh, the the house, if you want, that the bacteria uh, build together. Is that the sort of uh, strength in numbers aspect for them? So is it that if the bacterium isn't active, then the thing that the antibiotic is targeting basically isn't exposed, so there's nothing for it to target? That's what I got from it, but the biofilms have a couple more tricks. The antibiotic might not even be able to reach the bacteria, let alone hit the target once it gets there. That, and the biofilms actually have one more trick. Even if we do kill most of the bacteria, if there's this biofilm fortress thing, and you've got one of these nasty persister cells left alive, your whole infection can come raging back. Yeah, that's the challenge, and it's worse for implants like pacemaker electrodes and artificial knees. Biofilms, they seem to be able to build safe havens around these non-living structures where immune cells can't come from all sides. So this is what Professor Violi was talking about when she said that eventually we could not be able to perform surgeries. Do I have that right? Yeah, this is part of it. Surgeries with implants are going to be at particular risk. So what can you do about a biofilm? You break it up. That's one of the things that the team is trying to do, and they've even had some early success. We'll hear more about that in a future episode. For now, I want to talk more about the big picture for this project, the computer model. 
They wanted to have that up and running at the end of the first year of the project. Wow, they thought they could get that going inside a year? Professor Viola is not to be underestimated. The job basically entails collecting whatever data they can find about what chemicals and nanoparticles affect what bacteria, and then making the machine learning computer program that can trawl the database and look for trends. What features seem to be best for attacking a particular type of bacteria. So basically, we want to be able to classify data. What that means is that uh, um, relate somehow nanoparticle characteristic and the efficacy. Also, we are interested in identifying hypotheses of the interactions between nanoparticle and bacteria. So that eventually the final goal is to have a target profile of nanoparticles basically a checklist for what you want a nanoparticle to right. include. So I would like to say to this, this uh, engine, if you want to call an engine. I'm just going to note here that our producer Kate wanted to call the engine an oracle. Angela was definitely not comfortable with that. Some kind of prophecy maker? A prophet of antibacterial activity. Intelligent designer of nanoparticles. I can see you rolling your eyes, Kate. Professor Violi went with computational engine. Engine, if you want to call an engine, a computational engine to tell me your ideal nanoparticle should have about this a shape, this a charge, this uh, composition, so that we can intelligently design that. So the expensive part, like the first step when we talk about 10,000 molecules, is going to disappear at this point, because with this kind of a trick, if you want, we can use only 500 nanoparticles. That's what we hope. And so 500 experiments are doable. <laughs> It's a paradigm shift going from screening compounds to intelligently design. What I mean by intelligently is use machine learning to provide hypotheses of what could be the best design. Wait, they have to start with 10,000 molecules? That's how antibiotic discovery works at pharma companies right now. They'll make 10,000 molecules because molecules, they just aren't that hard to make. And they'll see how well they work against whatever bacteria they're targeting. Nanoparticles, on the other hand, those are a bit harder to make, so the Blue Sky team can't do the brute force route. They need to be smart about which nanoparticles they produce. So they are making this computational engine to filter out the possibilities and find their 500 best candidates. Right, then they'll make those. They're still going to have to do some trial and error with their 500 nanoparticles, but it's like 5% of the trial and error that they were doing with the molecules. Angel, you used the word paradigm, the word's paradigm shift. Yeah. When you're finished here, what do you hope that the pharmaceutical industry would take away from what you've done? I'm hoping to get the pharmaceutical company involved much earlier. So I'm not thinking about the end of the blue sky, but hopefully if we are able already to come up with this computational engine that can demonstrate the ability to, first of all, create a classification or correlation between structures and activity in terms of bacteria, that will be a great advancement for the pharmaceutical company also, because basically what we are saying is, that is a, the ability to reduce the timeline to develop a product. That's really exciting that the nanobiotics group is trying to get this to industry before Blue Sky is even over. Well, that's their hope. And one thing she stresses is that this isn't about making the next nanobiotic. It's about the method that will help us keep winning the arms race against bacteria. If we develop the nanobiotic right now in the next, you know, 100 years, they will not be useful anymore. But with this blue sky, what we are aiming is to just develop this computational machine. It's a framework that can be, it's like spinning the wheel. And then maybe something else comes up and then we can still use the same approach to come up with a, a solution. Are they also making some antibiotics? They are. We'll hear about their biofilm buster made from quantum dots next time, along with an update on the computational engine. Till then, I'm your host, Jim Lynch. And I'm Nicole Cassell-Moore. See you next time, everybody.